we're done with the first third of our course. Um, we covered some big picture at the beginning. We had two neuroscience lectures, um, and then Amy last week covered some brain imaging techniques at a high level. Um, today we're jumping into the second third of our course, um, heavily math and programming focus. Um, today we're going over signal processing, um, specifically digital signal processing. Um, next week will be some elementary ML. Um, lecture 7 will be focused on working with EEG data. Lecture 8 will be focused on EMG data. And lecture 9 will be focused on fMRI data. Um, and then after that, we'll do a neurotech and medicine lecture. We will do an ethics lecture. And then we'll wrap up the course with some more big picture, some current state of the field, and where you should go from there. <coughs> so, I actually don't have slides for today. Um, we're going to be going through Jupyter notebooks. Um, but just to give a quick outline, um, I'm going to give an introduction to signal systems and convolution, um, which are kind of the bread and butter of signal processing. Um, number two, I'll talk about some filtering. Um, and number three, I'll talk about Fourier. Um, for your series and for your transforms. Um, has anyone taken EE120 or EE123? One hand. Okay. Um, so EE120 is one This might be like a bit of a repeat for you. Um, how many people have taken EE16B? Okay. Um, so EE16B is one hand. Okay. Um, so that's actually a prereq for 120-123, but I'll try to make this as simple and clear as possible. Um, so let's go ahead and navigate to our GitHub. Um, so the link is github.com slash neurotech berkeley slash neurotech dash course. Um, so I'll give you a minute to navigate to that. So if you are familiar with um, GitHub and Git, then go ahead and if you're not, don't worry, give me a sec. Um, <coughs> go, go ahead to your terminal. Um, and go ahead and clone the repository. Um, so copy that link. Um, navigate to your terminal, do git space clone space the link and press enter. Um, that will download the repository to your, to your local computer. Yeah. Um, if you can do that, I'm assuming you know how to open Jupyter Notebooks. So go ahead and navigate to the signal processing folder and type in Jupyter Notebook. Um, if you do not know how to do any of that, no worries. Um, just go ahead and click here, signal processing, lecture five. And go ahead and click on signal systems and convolution. So we're going to three notebooks today, this is the first one. Good. Okay. 
So I mean, it just looks nicer if it's on your local. Uh, but like, no worries if you're doing it in GitHub. Um, so why are we interested in signal processing? Um, later in the course, as I mentioned, we'll be working with the EG data, we'll be working with EMG data and fMRI data. Um, those are real life signals, um, and we usually have to do some form of processing before we can do ML, before we can um, write code for user applications. Um, that signal processing can take multiple forms, um, but today I'm just going to go over the mathematical basics of some of the core things that you should be able to do with signals. Um, and then we'll jump into, into the coding and actual manipulation of signals um, in lecture seven. Do I need to zoom in? Yes, sir. All right. So it's convenient to think of signals as functions um, of one or more variables. So you can think of a speech signal um, is a function of time. So if you record a voice memo, um, you're recording the amplitude of your voice um, as a function of time. Uh, images can be thought of as signals. Uh, images are functions of two spatial variables, x and y. There's no time element um, because images are static. Um, so at a certain x and y position, you have an RGB value um, for an image. So your inputs are x and y, your output is an RGB triplet. You can have a video signal. Video signals are functions of three variables. You have the x and the y, but you also have time, because videos are images essentially stitched together. So at time t equals 10, at x equals 10, and y equals 5, you have a certain RGB triplet. Um, so most people don't think of images and videos as signals, but it turns out that you can you know, think of them as this. Um, we have two types of signals, discrete time and continuous time. Uh, we denote continuous time with, uh, with x of t. Um, that depends on some real value to time variable t. Um, so t takes on real values. And then discrete time signals um, are denoted with x square bracket of n, where n is some integer value variable that indexes instance of time. Um, so we're going to focus on discrete time signals um, and in general digital signal processing. So as we'll talk about later, computers cannot store continuous time signals um, because you need infinite memory to store real value numbers. Um, hence our focus on discrete time signals. So there are two ways to get discrete time, discrete time signals. Number one, they're inherently discrete. So the number of cars that pass through a tunnel every day, that's inherently discrete. You can't have 5.32 cars pass through a tunnel on a given day. Um, it's either five or six, it's some integer value. Um, in the other case, a discrete time signal is a sampled version of a continuous time signal. So I've denoted the continuous time signal here with a capital X of T. Um, and I sample it at 1 over t, which is my sampling rate. Um, in other words, every t seconds. Um, so you can see I'm picking out the value of that continuous signal um, uh, at, one times, at 0 times t, at 1 times t, at 2 times t, and so on. Any questions about the differences between discrete time and continuous time? So for example, um, actually we'll skip that. So there are two <coughs> discrete time signals that you should be familiar with. Um, number one is the unit impulse, and number two is the unit step. Does anyone want to come down and draw each of these for me? Sure. 
So what's that? It's zero. Okay. Um, can you build unit stuff? skip over these. Um, it would be helpful <coughs> to do at home, but you can write the unit impulse in terms of the unit step and vice versa mathematically. So we also have systems. Um, the definition of a system is pretty straightforward. Um, it takes in an input signal and it does something to that signal and then outputs another signal. Um, Again, we're focusing on discrete time. So in discrete time, you do not inputs as x of n and your outputs as y of n. Um, and here in this notebook, I'm representing systems as x of n, right arrow, y of n. So you input x of n and your system outputs y of n. <coughs> Any questions about what a system is? Okay. So, I'm going to talk about some system properties um, that you should be familiar with. Number one is memory. So a system is said to be memoryless if its output at any given time depends on the input only at that time. Um, so for example, System because the output depends on the input only at that time. If I wrote y of n is equal to 5 times x of n minus 1, then my system depends on the past. So it requires memory to store that previous information. So, you know, at n equals 5, you have to know what the input was at n equals uh, at 4, at time 4. So there's that memory involved, so it's not memory. Um, a system is causal if its output at any given time depends on the input only at that time and previous times. So what I have on the board right now, y of n is equal to 5 times x of n minus 1, that's a causal system. If it was y of n is equal to 5 times x of n plus 1, that would depend on the future and it would not be causal. Any questions? about those two properties. Number three is stability. Um, it's actually called BIBO or BIBO stability. Um, bounded input, bounded output. So if your system is stable, then if your input is bounded, your output should be bounded. Um, in other words, if you can find an input that is bounded that produces an unbounded output, then your system is not stable. These last two are super important. Um, so let's go over that. Number one, linearity. Uh, a system is linear. It satisfies two conditions. Number one is the scaling condition. So if I multiply my input to the system by some constant a, then my output should be multiplied by that same constant a. <coughs> and number 
two is the superposition property um, for any two systems. So x1 of n outputs y1 of n, and x2 of n outputs y2 of n. If I add those two systems together, if I add the two inputs, I should get the outputs added. So there's a quick way to check if a system is not linear. Um, you give an input of zero. And if the output isn't zero, then the system isn't linear. Um, that's because of the scaling property. If A equals zero, then my output should be zero. And lastly, we have time variance. Um, this is like the most complicated to understand, I think. Um, essentially, in layman's terms, it's saying that if your rule for generating the output changes with time, then your system is not time variant. Um, in other words, if you shift your input by some amount n, then your output should be shifted by that same amount n. Any questions on linearity or time variance? Okay. So let's talk about a special type of system called the LTI system. Um, it's called LTI because it's a linear system and it's also a time variant system. So it has those two properties at minimum. Um, and the nice thing about LTI systems is that just with the input response, <coughs> which we'll talk about in a bit, you can determine the system's response to any other input. So what is the impulse response? The impulse response denoted H of n is the system's response to the unit impulse. So just to remind you, the unit impulse was equal to one at n equals zero, and it was equal to zero everywhere else. So if I deliver to my system that unit impulse, just that one clap at n equals zero, I get an impulse response. It's called the impulse response because I'm feeding a unit impulse. And I denote that by H of n. And that is all I need to determine the output of the system to any other input x of n. So I'm going to prove that. I'm going to try to make this clear. Um, the math gets a little hairy. Um, but I feel like it's important for you guys to understand this um, so that when you're performing convolution, which I'll talk about in like two minutes, you know what's going on. Um, when you're actually coding this, it's very simple. It's like dot and ball. Um, but you should be familiar with the math. So let's say we have some input x of n. I'm going to rewrite it as the summation of these products. So the value of my input at an integer k times the unit impulse at n minus k. So take about 15 minutes. 15 seconds to internalize that. Why that makes sense. <laughs> so I'm rewriting my input as the sum of these signals. So let's look at k equals zero. Um, we have the value of my input at zero times my unit impulse at n minus zero, or n. So that gives me one times x of zero. Let's look at k equals 1. I have x of 1, which is the value of my input at k equals 1, times my unit impulse at, at minus 1, which is also 1 times x of 1. So I'm basically just decomposing my input into this sum. Um, so because we know that our system is linear and time invariant, what I can do is calculate the output 
for each of these inputs and then add up all the outputs. So this is because of the superposition, uh, yeah, superposition property. So I'm rewriting my input as the sum of these signals. I'm going to input each signal into my system, get the outputs, and add all the outputs. So let's focus on this input now. X of k is just a scalar, and this is a signal. So what I can do is make this my input signal, calculate the output, and multiply by x of k. And that's because of the scaling property of the new system. So what is the output of my system for this input, the shift to unit impulse? So by definition, what we defined earlier, the output of the unit impulse at n is just my impulse response. And since our system is time invariant, I can shift this by k, and my output, my impulse response should be shifted by k as well. So now we're gonna, we're gonna work backwards. So I have this relationship. I know I input this to my system, I get this. Let's multiply each side by x of k. So this is true. Um, and now I add up, I add this up for every possible value of k, <coughs> negative infinity to positive infinity, and I'm able to rewrite my output as this. So as you can see, my output is solely determined by my input and the impulse response. That's why linear time variant systems are so powerful. All I need is my input and the impulse response of that system, and I can determine the output for any other input. So if that didn't make sense, um, take a look at it at home, <coughs> try to internalize it. Um, But that's kind of a proof for why we only need the input response when we're dealing with linear time variant systems. So this operation on the right is called the convolution of signals x and h. Um, we denote it with the star over here, x star h. So in other words, the output of your system to some input x is the convolution, con convolution of x and your impulse response. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, if you want to do some convolution code, all you have to do is np.convolve, which takes in three arguments. It takes in your input array. So signals in Python are presented as arrays, as numpy arrays. Um, you give np.convolve your numpy array, which represents the impulse response, and then you specify the mode, um, which is something we'll talk about in a later lecture. So when it comes to actually programming this, it's super simple, um, but do try to understand the math um, for future lectures. Um, we're short on time, so I'm gonna skip this section at the end, but it turns out you can also use the impulse response to determine if a system is causal and stable. So try to go ahead and complete those proofs um, later. Does anyone have any questions about LTI systems and convolution? Specifically this proof over here. Big picture, if you want the output of an LTI system to any input, all you need is the input response, and your input, obviously. So go ahead and close this notebook, and jump onto the second notebook, <coughs> which is filtering.ipymb. Um, if you're on GitHub, just go back one and click on filtering.ipymb. Still under the signal processing folder.
I'm going to speed up a little because we have 12 minutes. Um, okay, so it's useful to look at the outputs of LTI systems when our input is a complex exponential. Um, because of this really nice property. When you input a complex exponential to an LTI system, your output is that same complex exponential, um, but just scaled by a factor. So, let's say our input to, sorry, I need to zoom in. Um, let's say our input to our LTI system um, forget about the complex for now, let's just say it's an exponential, z to the n. Um, that's our input to the LTI system, and h of n is our system's impulse response. So using the convolution operation from the previous notebook, I can calculate my output. Because I have my input, z to the n, and I have my impulse response, h of n. So this is just performing the convolution of my input z to the n and my impulse response. Um, I can break up the z to the power of n minus k into z to the n and z to the negative k and take the z to the n out of the summation because z to the n just don't depend on k. So what you'll see is I have this scalar, which we call the transfer function of our system, multiplied by the original input to our system z to the n. <coughs> so I've inputted something, and I've got the same thing, just scaled. If there's one thing you take out of this, you input an exponential, you get the exponential scale. And that scalar is the transfer function of our system. It's denoted with a capital H. So that was with just an exponential. Let's make it a complex exponential. So I'm going to set z equal to e to the power of j omega. J is what engineers use for square root of negative one. Um, you're probably used to I, but here we use J. Um, <laughs> don't blame me, um, blame all the engineers. Um, and then omega is a variable for frequency. The frequency of our complex exponential is omega. So then our input becomes X of N is e to the power of J omega N because our input was e to the n, I'm just plugging in e to the j omega. So our output is just e to the j omega n, which is our input, scaled by the transfer function evaluated at e to the power of j omega. So in this special case where our input is a complex exponential, the transfer function becomes something called the frequency response. So don't worry too much about the math. I want you to take away this one fact. We are feeding in our, to our system a complex exponential e to the j omega n, and we are receiving as output e to the j omega n scaled by our frequency response. So what we can do now is design our system, our LTI system, so that this behaves how we want it to behave at certain values of omega. So, that's what a filter is. All a filter is is a special LTI system designed to behave how we want it to behave. So let's just look at one. Uh, let's look at the high pass filter. The high pass filter, remember, a filter is just an LTI system. It takes in an input, and what it does is it blocks out all the lower frequencies. That's why it's called high pass. It allows all the high frequency inputs to pass through. Um, for small values of the mega, those are null to zero. So how you design a high pass filter? You design a, a, a system that has a frequency response, h of e j omega, that evaluates to zero or close to zero when omega is small. So h of e j omega should be zero or close to zero when omega is small, when we have low frequencies. So if this is close to zero, then my output was zero times e to j omega <coughs> becomes zero. And that's what you're saying here. It's zero. For large values of omega, h of e j omega is designed by us to not be close to zero, 
so those frequencies pass through. That's all a filter is, not the magic. Um, as you can see, we have a bunch of different types of filters. Um, low pass, the high pass, the band pass, and the rest are kind of variations of those three. So when we deal with EEG, EMG, and fMRI data, we dive deeper into filters and how to design um, these systems so that we can block out certain frequencies um, and things like that. Any questions? Once again, the big idea of a filter is just an LTI system that has a frequency response designed to behave how we want it to behave at certain frequencies. All right, we have five minutes. I'm going to speed through the equivalent of like four lectures to be E120. Um, apologies, but go to the Fourier story. I was planning a nice extravagant story, but it's not going to happen in five minutes. But I'll give you guys some history. Um, French mathematician Fourier, um, you guys see that? Yeah. This is the last notebook, um, the Fourier story. Um, he made this controversial claim that any continuous periodic signal can be represented as the sum of sinusoidal waves. So I can take some signal and represent it as the sum of a bunch of sines and cosines. So, some people agreed with Fourier, some famous people didn't, such as Lagrange. Um, Lagrange was very powerful and famous at the time, so Fourier's paper was declined, and then once Lagrange died, his paper was published. Um, and it turned out to be mostly true. There are some edge cases where we're dealing with square waves, where it doesn't work out. Um, if we're looking at that, search up the Gibbs phenomenon. Um, but Fourier was mostly correct. You can take any signal, any continuous periodic signal, and you can represent it as the sum of sines and cosines. Why would you want to do that? Because as we saw earlier with LTI systems and complex exponentials, it's really nice when you input sines and cosines, you get a scaled output, essentially. So I'll try to get through as much of this as I can. Um, But let's start with the continuous time Fourier series, which applies to continuous and periodic signals. So here's an example of a continuous and periodic signal. It's periodic because it repeats itself, as you can see. And it's continuous because it's smooth, you don't see dots. <coughs> so the way we would calculate the Fourier analysis of this, um, this is just the formula. Um, you essentially have a bunch of sinusoidals represented as e to the power of j, k times the fundamental frequency times t. Um, I'm going to try to simplify this. You're representing this signal over here as the sum of a bunch of sinusoidals whose frequencies are integer multiples, hence the k times omega zero, integer multiples of the fundamental frequency. What is the fundamental frequency? is 2 pi over n, and n is the <coughs> period. Um, a, a signal is periodic if x of n plus capital N is equal to x of n. So once again, I have a bunch of sinusoidals, weighted sums, these are the coefficients. Um, but the key part is I have a sinusoidal with frequency that is an integer multiple of the fundamental frequency. I'm representing my signal, x of t, as the sum of these sinusoidals. So what if our signal is aperiodic? It's not periodic. So what we can do is take this chunk over here and just repeat it in both directions infinitely. And then take the limit of the period as the period approaches infinity. So it's just one large period. Um, and you get this beautiful equation, magic. Um, this is called a frequency spectrum. You input <coughs> a frequency, omega, and you get the power of that frequency. So omega is the frequency of the sinusoidal you're interested in, and you receive that coefficient. Um, so quickly 
jump over to the discrete time Fourier transform. Similar deal, except you have a discrete signal. So a sample of a, a sample of continuous time signal, or it's inherently discrete. Um, once again, representing it as the sum of sinusoidals. So I'm breaking up the signal into some sinusoidals, um, and I get a continuous frequency spectrum. I input my frequency, and I get the coefficient. So last remark, um, computers cannot store continuous signals, continuous functions. So the DFT is essentially a sample version of the DTFT. <coughs> um, and the, the DFT and then the algorithm to calculate the DFT, the fast Fourier transform, are super important to signal processing, specifically visual signal processing. Um, these are the techniques that you will see a lot with the EEG, EMG, and fMRI data. I quickly want to show some give you some connection to why the FFT is important. Um, the way that EEG is broken up into these frequency bands is with the fast Fourier transform. So it's important. Um, and I will show you guys how to do that with code in a later lecture. Any questions? That was a lot of material. Um, easily 10 to 12 lectures of signal processing class this year, all in 30, 45 minutes. Um, if you have questions, you can come talk to me after. Um, we'll post all the notebooks, or they're already up there on GitHub. Post the slides, uh, attendance form is here. And thank you so much.